Hey, welcome to the Runaways Podcast. My name is Cody, and today I am joined with James and Dan, uh, and we're going to be talking about the season. It is ProQuest season. It is snuck up on us. Uh, we had Pro Tour. Uh, feels like we just got done with RTN season, and now we're into what I think is arguably one of the hardest seasons to do well in uh, for, you know, at least a local level, uh, is ProQuest season. Um, and James was kind enough to join us. And I think at James, you've been killing it, uh, probably like under the radar for most people in the last several major events that we've been going to, uh, because I think you've been top four, top three, top five, uh, uh, placing a uh, member on the team at almost every single event, typically like one, sometimes two wins out of top eight, top eighting the event. Uh, you've been cashing continually. Uh, so they haven't heard from you in a little while. So how has Fab been treating you uh, recently? Fab has been very nice to me. I don't know why. I yell at her every single week and be like, this game kind of sucks. But, you know, when it sucks, I guess it's good for me. Um, the downpowering of the game feels like it's good for me because it's a lot of just like raw skill. And apparently I can do math better than other people, which is always nice. Um, but other than that, like, I don't know, just got back from LA and have not really touched fab at all. And now I got to go back into the crunching of everything. Uh, after Dromai goes, I don't know what to play. I imagine we'll talk about that today. I mean, to be fair, I don't think you've played Dromai in a while, right? It's been, it's been like a bit anyway, since you played Dromai. Yes. It's not that I will change what I'm doing because Dromai, it's everybody else. I have a lot of Dromai in my area. So if I can't bonk them with Dawnblade, what am I to do? <laughs> Fair. And Dan, you and I will be seeing a lot of each other in the next four weeks uh, for ProQuest yep. season <laughs> as we were looking at the schedule and something weird happened in our area. So for people who don't know, I'm in Pennsylvania and it's like right outside Philly. And then a, a bunch of the uh, team is in what north jersey is that what it's technically called yeah i would call it north jersey N north jersey area um and normally there are enough pro quest events in which we only have to see each other at a couple for some reason this season they have like we're like negative five pro quest events well, it's kind of plus because we get to go to one every yeah no, we've every always we've always basically been able to do that though but you yeah. usually had like multiple options this season, it's like, we're still going to get to go to enough of them. We're still going to like seven, which is way more of a benefit than a lot of other areas have. But normally, we, you could go to the Jersey ones, and I could go to the PA ones, and it was all nice. But now we're just going to like five out of the seven of the same ones, right? Yep. That'll be fun. How does it feel uh, to be going to the ProQuest season, and then like knowing, I don't know what, we're going to have like five teammates at like every single one of them, basically? On top of like Michael Fang and, and you know other good players in the area. Oh yeah, I think uh, if you win a New Jersey Pro Quest, you absolutely deserve to be at the Pro Tour. Not New Jersey Pro Quest, a tri-state area Pro Quest yeah. this uh, this season. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. I mean, our area is just like it's a bunch of good players, which is fun. Uh, when you win your event, you've typically earned your win. Um, it is, it feels like when we go to uh, most of our events, uh, especially like this last year when we've, um, like lost some events. So we all consolidated, uh, more into events. It feels like when you win your event, like you had to go through a gauntlet in order to get your invite, um, as well. So that's always fun. Mm. It's funny switching from RTN season because like the meta being diverse, like everything was great. Best meta ever. It's like, so chill. He's got a top four. Everyone gets their invite. It's a good time. But now it's like, so cutthroat, like, <laughs> Only one of us is getting out of here. Yeah. You got to win. And uh, have to win. as everyone knows, that is something I'm not good at is actually winning the event. Um, to be fair, I do typically always win a pro quest. So yeah, pro quest is where I shine as well. Um, you know, an RTN pro quest, all those, I typically at least win one, uh, usually multiple, but it is, uh, it is a struggle. It is very hard to qualify like through merit uh, to pro tour. And I think people kind of overshadow that. Um, a lot but like winning a pro quest at least in most areas is like it's actually rather difficult even if your area isn't like super competitive it's still very hard because you have to win the event like you have to be first you don't get to like there's no leeway here um 
I think people don't give enough credit that, you know, winning a pro quest is kind of a big deal. Like it's, it's pretty hard for most players to, to qualify that way. If you're not like sitting on ELO. Um, I mean, how do you feel about ELO going into the season? James, I don't know. Where are you at in ELO? You know, I am 24th in the world. I'm like just shy of 1900. Yeah. You and I are uh, sitting LA. right next to each other. Yeah. LA was very nice to me. Yeah. It was the opposite. I dropped, I, I like gained 50 ELO total the whole weekend. And then I dropped like five points in the, in the ladder. Now <laughs> uh, that battle hard all coming for you. ruined me. Uh, <laughs> Hell yeah. It's funny though. No, like, I... If I cared, I would just not play any pro quests, right? Like, cause I'm like auto qualified if I don't play any pro quests, but like, like I like, do we know the cutoff date? Don't know the cutoff date, but it's going to be like, is it after nationals? Probably after nationals. Probably, right? Mm, I think it's probably before Nationals. Oh, sorry. I meant to say before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm not going to let it not let me play, right? Like, I'm definitely going to play the game. That's why we play the game. Who cares? Yeah, it'll change that battle numbers so fake. minimal anyway. You would think. That's true. Unless you, like, actually bomb the event, right? Like, uh, You mean pro quest? If you have a losing record, sure, you're going you're gonna to move quite a bit. Uh, you mean the... Elo change at ProQuest, you mean? At ProQuest, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I said Battleheart. I don't know. Yeah, you said Battleheart. I, I, like, I was like, I lost like 50 <laughs> no, no, points Battle, Battle at Harden the Battleheart. Is, is, is real. <laughs> no, I meant at ProQuest. Like, as long as you have like a winning record, like whatever, you yeah. should be safe. Yeah, the LL Battleheart was not good for me. I gained like 90 Elo no. at, <laughs> at Pro Tour, and then I like gave 50 of it back. I was like, I'll, I'll, in two rounds. In two rounds. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yikes. That was uh, not a profitable play, but I did get to play Chain again, so I can't complain about that. Mm. But okay, so this is going to be an interesting ProQuest season because we're going into week one, and it's the same meta. Nothing has changed. We are, yeah. we, we've Big all prepped for this. Big fan, first week. Yep, just run it back. Just run it back. I mean, I feel very confident saying I'm playing Hatchets. I'm just going to play the same deck I have all the reps into that I really like. Just going to play Hatchets. I assume other people are going to play hatchets as well. Happy little warrior gamers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great choice, especially with draw my soul in the meta. And it's like one of the decks that can combat it. Um, and then draw my will be gone after the first weekend. It's nearly impossible. She's not. Um, so, and then it, and it's like snap gone, which is going to be great. Uh, that Monday yep. next, next Monday, there'll be no draw my anymore. What time does it go into effect? I don't know. Wow. Like my okay. army's on Monday. Like I, I'm sure we'll just like house no, 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 it, my, but uh, it goes into effect not until the fall the next Friday, I think, isn't it? Isn't that how it works? Like it it gets released on Wednesday and it, or on Monday and it's available till next Friday. Oh, that sucks. I'm sure we just won't play Joe Mai, though. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and it'll be gone. And then we have a brand new meta in the middle of ProQuest. So it, this is like one of those unique situations in which you Finally. have you have a new meta. That will never see the light of day outside of this like four week or five week period, right? I don't, I can't remember, you know, a lot of times where this has happened because we have a new set dropping next month. So that's a whole brand new meta. So this is going to be like the meta that everyone forgets exists. You just, it's just going to exist for ProQuest season and that's it. And James, what do you think going in? No, no Dromai. Where are we at? I, I'm a bit lost. I'm probably going to stick with Warrior. I don't know if it's going to be Dory, though. Kind of looking at Kasai. Kasai, maybe with some hatchets. Good luck. It's so hard when you don't have the third swing. Yeah, but then I have guys. And then I have blood in our hands. It's great. I, I, I agree. It feels like that way. Have you played any Kasai games lately? I have. Oh, have you? Okay. Not. Okay, I was going to say, because <laughs> as soon as you start playing it, you go, what am I doing with my life? I can't swing yeah, a third time. It's so hard time. to go back. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. I was trying to prep Kasai, because that's like, I was like, oh, it's if dromai has gone, Kasai has to be great, right? And then I was playing Kasai, and I was like, this feels terrible. Yeah, it's like trying to play other card games after playing Flesh and Blood. Yeah. Or specifically Magic, I guess. It's like, <laughs> what am I doing with my time? I don't know. I, I get that all the time. Dan? What are you looking forward to playing after Dromai is gone? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I feel like everyone's just going to play what they've been playing, except for the people who are like, I can't play my deck because Dromai, which will be like, I don't know, like less than 10 people at the event. 
Maybe. I don't think the impact's going to be huge, but I might try and like innovate based on the new meta. It looks pretty fun. I might just. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I might just slam KO, roll some scabs into my ProQuest invite for a tour invite. I mean, that's all you have to do. Just roll scabs. We were doing it yeah. last night. Yeah. The deck's kind of nuts. <laughs> roll scabs, hit a one, still win the game. Yeah. Balanced. Just got to roll scabs again and then it's fine. Yeah. We just got just to gotta even out. I will, uh, I'll say, so if you're going in to this weekend, you should probably play, you know, like, what, KO, Kano, Draw My Maybe, Hatchet, Dory, Dory, Katsu, Azalea, Katsu, this is a pretty long list, Azalea, there's lots, I think Victor's real, Victor, yeah, a lot of areas are pretty uh, Victor heavy, I mean, I know our area will be, it's like, yeah, I'm worried once Draw My's gone, that it's just gonna be Victor everywhere, it's just gonna be so much Victor, I guarantee it, yeah, it's Kano time, I think. That would be a good way to, to roll through it. Um, I think this ProQuest season, it will be a lot more interesting than I, at least our past ones will be. Uh, I'm hoping to just get a win out of the gate on like week one and then just like have fun with like decks that I want to play for the rest of the season because this is like a great season to do it because the meta is like completely shook up and you can start playing like your fringe deck that you could never bring before and like your chance of winning are actually real because before it was just like if I ever hit a draw, I just lose, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. playing any anything that just like auto draw my lost decks i know james is excited about it because his whole area is draw my it's just like all draw my players mm-hmm. and so any, sure. you can bring anything right theoretically but also like people are so accustomed to just having to like beat fino or myself on draw my or whatever bullshit i'm bringing so if i just bring like a random deck they won't know what to do it's great that's a, definitely a good advantage uh, to have. So if you have your second deck uh, prepped uh, after this weekend, it'll be, it'll be worth, worth digging into, maybe get some free wins uh, based on that as well. Um, but going into this ProQuest season, we have to attempt to win to get your Amsterdam qualification, right? Um, unfortunately, these don't pass down. And uh, Whoa, I thought they, they do to down. second, right? Yeah, they pass down to second if the first place player already has an invite through winning. Through winning, <laughs> yes. Um, but I will say there's a phrase that might, you know, you might want to learn, and I'm not telling anyone to do this, but a, a really good phrase when you're sitting down to the finals might be something along the lines of, I would like to restructure the prizing. Mm-hmm. That's it's a good phrase. And don't attempt to move the invite. You cannot move the invite. You cannot move the invite. I would you can like move the gold foil and any additional prize. And any additional prize. Mm-hmm. So I would uh, I would expect that that happens more at ProQuest than I think you know any other event, uh, mm-hmm. like at a local level, because especially uh, when it's international, I find that like people, I'm like, are you going to Amsterdam? Like, not going to Amsterdam. Would you like to redistribute the pricing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you technically shouldn't do that in that spot like I, I think if you um uh try and understand their intent for attending pro tour it's like can be conceived as a as a bribe or perceived as a bribe i've heard judges say that would be i think that that would be a very loose ruling in my opinion it could happen i guess but mm. that's a very yeah, loose I, I think way the, to say Another conversation you had before this is impacting this current conversation that's all uh, ag- within agreed. the bounds of the rules, right? Like, Yeah. The safest way is just to say, like, second place gets the gold foil, and then yeah. you do what you want to do. You play the game or you don't. Yeah. Uh, I, I honestly wish you didn't have to jump through all those hoops. Like, I understand that, like, in some aspect, people want, like, they, they would like to, like, play the game out and see who wins. And that does happen, you know quite often as well. There's been plenty of times where it's just like I sit down at my pro quest and then we just play the finals and it's whatever. Um, unless typically, unless the opponent brings it up. Um, I don't typically bring it up. Um, just because I feel like a little uncomfortable doing that myself. Um, just cause people know who I am and they might already think that they might not be able to win or something else. And I don't, I don't ever want to like, um, well, I don't think any of these things are accurate. Um, I would, I do like to say that, like, I don't ever want people to feel that way 
when we sit down in the finals across from me, they're like, well, this is probably the best thing that for me to do. So I'll do it. Like, I, I don't, I, I want, only want people to do that. If like, that's what they want to do. Right. Yeah. You know, sitting down. But it's also it. like, it's a lot like a PTI event where like, <clears throat> I'm pretty down on just say second place gets gold foil and then play it out. Yeah. Like pro tour invites worth like the same. Typically. Yeah. Pretty close. Mm-hmm. I'll probably I don't propose know. that hedge until I, I get my win. In my area, the gold foil, we either do like a final split or a four way split for the top. And then, like, I never need an invite for half these things because it used to be ELO or XP. So mm-hmm. just be like, dance monkeys. I love my splits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Uh, I just, I wish we just didn't have to beat around the bush about it. You know what I mean? Like, yep. Uh, <laughs> it's just, I, I understand at larger events, I understand that, like, you don't want to encourage stuff like this at like pro tours and things like that. But it's just like, to be honest, a lot of these pro quests, like you walk in and there's like, maybe, maybe there's like 32 people there and there's like four people in the room who are actually trying to qualify for, for Amsterdam. Right. Like, Oh yeah. Especially when they're like international. Yeah. 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 When they're like more local here, it's not as, not the same. Like it usually ends up being a much wider net, but when they're like international, like mm-hmm. Amsterdam, like, going to walk in and they'll be more at ours because there'll be like half the team there. And, you know, like, <laughs> like Michael Fagg and a bunch of other, like, like locals that are, you know, really strong and try and trying to go to majors. So, but when you walk in and let's say only half the people there are actually trying to go to Amsterdam or a fourth of the people there are trying to go to Amsterdam, it's like, can we just like make everyone happy? You know what I mean? Like, isn't there a way to be able to do that, that, you know, without having to beat around the bush, but no. So I think that is, that's the only part I don't like about it. Um, but I do like that once you win, it passes on the second. So you don't have to feel bad about them playing the game out once you've already won one. You're not taking it away from anyone other than, you know, obviously in top eight. But in the finals, it's just like get to the finals, they like auto qualify, which is great. Yeah, no, it's a nicer structure than RTN. There's like no reason to to scoop until, or just, there just isn't yeah. at that point. Agreed. Okay. Uh, I'm excited to play this weekend. I was testing other decks this week a little bit. Um, and then I played hatchets a couple of games and said, oh, so, so nice to be back on the hatchet deck. Oh, this is a real deck. This is a real man's deck. We just put so much time mm. in. Like, I, there's no way I'm switching when I have all this time invested and all this deep knowledge of matchups. Well, I was going to play. I was I thinking about playing Prism this weekend. Like, legitimately, mm. I was like, oh, maybe I'll just bring Prism. Like, I, I actually enjoy playing the deck. And I was like, I was like, oh, and I played like, I don't know, six or seven Prism games, and I won all of them. And I was like, ooh, maybe I bring Prism. And then I played my eighth game. In my eighth game, I drew no Heralds for five turns. And all, like, it, my hand was just three no blocks. And then, like, like the, the E-Strike, the light E-Strike. And I was just like, oh, no. I just did this for five rounds straight. And I was like, I just lose to an Azuri. Like, this is, this is disgusting. Thanks. Um, don't like, do that inside I, guy. I was like, maybe I don't play Prism. And then I was like playing hatchets and I'm like, oh god, it's so much better. Uh, it's so smooth. <laughs> but it feels hard to get off the deck, right? Yep. It'll be fun to adjust the deck when Joe My leaves. That'll be a adjust. fun couple of days. Like do, surely do we're we... taking Dawnblade out, yeah. I probably. It's not for anything else. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, not a big secret. Yeah, and there's three blues that don't do anything. Yeah, well, at least six blues, I would say. Warrior's Valor doesn't do anything. Mm, I don't fully agree. Bad. I mean, I'm still playing driving, uh, like the driving blade. Because the amount oh, of times, yeah, the amount of times I just cast it in a, in a game, like I'm not happy about it, but the amount of times I do it, I'm like, I can't get rid of this one. Like, mm-hmm. no, I think Warrior Valor is pretty real against like some aggro decks because you can mm-hmm. just do it to present the third swing. Sure. Or threaten it and make the block four. I don't think I've ever done that. In all, in all the games really? I've ever played. I've uh-huh. had it come up. Yeah, that rarely comes up. Mm, Why aren't I just blocking with this card? Why, yeah. why are we playing it? <laughs> you know it blocks mm. three, right? Instead of adding one. Yeah, no, it's, it's not like I'm choosing to play it offensively instead. It's like I just have this card. I mean, the main now thing... you have to block. The main thing I'm excited about is to put... Like, hold the line in the deck, right? Like, mm-hmm. it'll be great to actually... I don't know, be- maybe... You guys all laughed at me when I said we should consider this card. No, we couldn't before. It was too tight with the amount of Gogans you needed for Dawnblade. 
But now you just ripped them we, off. We had one. Hand. We had one slot, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, the one of three of you're gonna like hit. You're gonna hit quite often. Yeah, yeah. One of sure. you're just like rolling the die. But I can't wait to put three of them in the deck and be like, oh, oh, my KO match. Oh, it's so much better. It's just like significantly better. We can actually match some of the other people who are playing hatchets in their interesting. Game. KO. I think more aggression is what we need. Oh no. Blue block five into two pieces. Yes, please. Yeah, that's pretty maybe, good. Maybe a little uh cleave action. Maybe. I don't know. I built one today. I, I, I built a post my build today and I just went through and went, I could throw in a second helmet. <laughs> like it was like there was like nothing that like revolutionary. I was like, I could put this in, but it still doesn't fit the mana curve. It's not like the mana curves now supports an, a cleave, right? Oh yeah, most of the kind of equipment like mess with the uh the new grains. I was like, what do I lose to? Uh command and conquer. What's good against command and conquer? Crown. Oh, I can run crown now. That's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. I'll probably put my one of route back in the deck for for these local victors. <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> it's a secret. One of route. Ooh. Maybe one it's of okay. singing. One of singing. Go with it. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Shift came out of my new build. I was like, I don't need shift anymore. But it was nice. I mean, it. I'm sure there's a ton we could do with the deck, but there's like, I just wanted to keep doing the thing I was doing. So the deck just looks the same. It just has yep. different blues now. <laughs> like one more in the swing and then a new helmet that, that, that's it i was like i was like oh i thought about putting in this the third sigil and i was like okay that's probably too much no 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 third sigil <laughs> that's only if you're trying to like survive some of these combo decks or something crazy you have like tackle of last one becomes a thing or or... like kano mm-hmm. well it yeah, like even... that or max or bolton the, the sad thing is it does nothing against kano if they're stacking like, so even if you take no damage and go up to, like, 49 health, um, their stack still kills you. Because the last Aether uh, still do- does, like, 50 damage by itself. It depends. If, if you have double Oasis and Blues, well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. If they can't kill Oasis, you. If, but... I, I think Sigil might matter if you have one Oasis and Blues. We have to do the math. But, it, okay, ultimately, like, it, it doesn't really matter. You don't get through your, your whole deck anyway. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to play pro, to- or pro quest. Uh, and mm-hmm. then right after pro quest season, we have like what a week, I think. And then we get all the spoilers uh, for the next set. And then it is off to the races. Yep. And I am super excited uh, for, our- I'm so excited. And we could talk a little bit. We don't need to go through like all the spoilers and stuff, but um, cause we've only really seen chi cards at this point. Um, but what are your, I would like to hear some of your first impressions on what do you think of the chi cards? What do you think mm-hmm. of the idea overall? Um, Dan, I know we were talking about this a little earlier today, but what do you think so far of the cards that you've seen? Uh, spoiler cards. I love that the shuffle card exists. I've wanted this since the game started. <laughs> I wish it was Daenerys. <laughs> shuffle your deck on a card. A whole like, card for yep. shuffle your deck. It's everything I why, ever wanted. <laughs> why doesn't it target? If it targeted your, oh, pool, shuffle your opponent's oh, deck, oh. oh, that that would be such a card oh. where it, the better your opponent is, the better the card would be. That card oh, would be game breaking. No, that would be so in good. some it matchups. Would, it would. Oh, you'd yeah. have to like, you'd have to like act like you're pit stacking anytime you play against a mystic deck. Oh, that would be so interesting. Just make them think they should shuffle your deck. Other games like that wouldn't matter. That wouldn't matter very much. They, yeah, it would have some yeah. utility, but like this game, no, that's like a crazy effect. That that would be busted in certain matchups. Yeah. That would go straight to LL format. Mess with but these uh, pit stack goldens. Casual players would just be like, "This is the worst card." They would have no idea what it's for. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Shuffle your pit stack. Like all of us are just like, "Oh God, I hope you never play that." Mm-hmm. Uh, That's funny. I uh, I like that all the chi cards are just like these dirtle do nothing cards, which. I don't. I don't know. I always have a soft spot in my heart for those, but I don't know. Yeah, my main takeaway is kind of somewhere. Um, I just I'm so excited for limited. Like you have to like. It feels like you have to work so hard to get like max value out of these stupid turtle cards, um, which I'm pretty excited for. It's like different, way different than heavy hitters. Obviously, just like throw numbers. 
now it's like it seems maybe easy to use like your whole hand but making your whole hand actually like produce meaningful value seems like you got to like think about it and, and plan towards it so i think it looks pretty sweet i'm a little nervous for this many non-blocks going into the deck mm-hmm. twice yep mm-hmm. because yep. once the first time you draw that's it, why i'm thinking it limited then it goes back to your deck and then you have another nine block again because you shuffle your deck. Yep. Like you want the card in your hand, but there's there's a lot of decks we've played that have no blocks and it's been pretty detrimental. Like their power has to be pushed so hard to make up the fact that you have no blocks. And James, you know all about this from all your prism days. Like you have to have a lot of raw value um, that you can slam on the board whether it's in permanence or something else to make up for the fact that you are playing cards that say you can't block. Yeah. I do think the abilities are pretty strong for like second cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once they flip in the G and like, then you yeah, just draw it. Draw. It's, it's like, um, it's like hard to find Dell and Dory, right? Like we're pitching a blue every turn regardless. Yeah. I mean, once, yeah, once they're but... Chi and you draw them as Chi. That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're pretty good. It's just like, that it's a lot of hoops and like the first effect isn't really worth a whole card and so like yep. you're taking you like actually have to pitch that huh no like you, you don't want to put two chi next to each other you shuffle doesn't only one card shuffle yep no but i think you'd prefer not to shuffle like if you have like six chi in your deck surely you want to space those out right i'm saying right now unless we we, we have to see some really powerful stuff to second cycle with a deck with no blocks that has never happened oh sure that's right I'm just I'm just putting it out here right now. Well, There's I mean, never I mean the, been a no block deck that has second cycled. I mean that makes me think of the illusionist, right? Like her whole thing seems to be uh, preventing damage. Mm-hmm. But it's like applies to all the classes, so it's like Ooh. you don't have you have cards that don't block, and you're trying to second cycle them. There's like no world, right? Like that's just that's just not happening. I don't know. I, I think that might be the illusionist thing. You're supposed to like second cycle, yeah, make these shields prevent damage. Now you have like disgusting power at the end we're gonna have to see some like really good like defensive stuff then like yep. like we need to see some distractions we got things. a blue sigil what do you mean kill one <laughs> so bad <laughs> yeah. no that's why i'm excited for limited like it doesn't matter um the power right because everyone's dealing with the same pool yeah yeah i think uh, you know limited is completely different but but if we have all these non-blocks limited might be cursed so but so far, we only have non-blocks at legendary, like high rarity cards. Yeah. So like, maybe limited won't have that many. But as of right now, no. no I think that one's fine. But like, you're gonna want like a good number of these in your CC decks, mm-hmm. and that's like before we see everything else. Um. So it just, I would like, I hope to see more. I am excited to see more. I'm intrigued. The art is beautiful. I just. We've never had a second cycle deck in which the cards don't block. So a little worried. Got to Got to show me some power, but obviously we've seen almost nothing of the set. Can't really make a, any like judge call there. Right. Of what, what's actually happening, yeah, but it's we exciting. We see some weapons too. Um, and I believe they should function in the way where you can respond to your instant with your other instant and they both see each other to get their mm-hmm. effects. Um, very similar to Kano. So like you're not like if you have two of them in your hand, you're like, oh okay, it's fine. You play one, respond to the other one with the instant. The last instant triggers, sees the one you played before it, the next one triggers, and see the first the the second one that you played. And then you then they go back to your hand as mana. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then you mm-hmm. get sad because you can only activate your ability once. Anyway, it does look interesting. I'm excited for the next set. Um, let's jump into some questions here. Okay. Bo Ferkel asks, uh, can you give some guidance around how to tech your deck against one matchup or another? Um, I'll say, as an example, kind of like how we teched uh, Dory into Dromai, uh, but some just general principles of how you actually tech a deck for another deck. That's a very large and wide question there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, first, I guess you have to identify that it makes sense to tech for a deck. Like for us with Dory, it was like, 
Charlie Droma is one of like top two, top three most played decks. We're not willing to never win this matchup, so let's see if there's any possible way of beating it. And then you go deep into that, and then you're like, we can do both strategies. Great, chip it. Um, to me, this question feels like when is it worth uh sideboarding or teching your deck for a deck? And one thing that comes to mind is back when old him and Prism were in the meta. And people would put all of these cards in for Prism as old him, but it never made sense because without these cards, it was like close to 100 0. And with these cards, it was like an 80 20. So, as both an old him and a Prism player, I just said, fuck that matchup. And I would just like put it like aside and just say, I will dodge that matchup. And that's what a lot of people ended up doing at Pro Tour 2 in Lil. They're just like, I hope the dodge, Cody. <laughs> and they did you, not. I think the, <laughs> yeah, they did not. And you knocked a lot of people up. But I, I think the best thing to tech for is when matchups are like kind of close and you know that adding these certain cards will add a significant percentage to your matchups, like turn a 50 50 into like, I don't know, a 60 40 or something. That sounds like pretty good tech to me, especially if it works for multiple matchups. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that is the big factor, like measuring the impact that it will have or estimating it. Like for for Dory, we went from like unwinnable matchup to like very favored. Yeah, well that that's, that's a no brainer. Yeah, agreed. That, agreed. That agreed. One was, yeah, yeah, it's also like not. It's not really teching. Like, so we did we did this yeah. in the opposite order. We we played Dory because we knew it could beat Romai. Like that's the opposite. Like, yeah, agree, agree. So like we we were playing other decks that couldn't beat Romai. And we knew that Dory could beat Dromai with Dawnblade because we had done it with, or at least I had it and a couple other people had done it with Great Axe, with the switchboard. Um, and so we already knew it had that ability. And then we were playing other warriors and said, well, even if Dory isn't necessarily as good as these other warriors in certain matchups, because it can beat Dromai, we should just play that deck and make the best hatchet version that we can. Like try and play, try and play Dory like Kasai but with Kasai actually being able to win the draw my matchup pretty consistently. And it was like, yeah, we so, teched our hero choice. Yeah. To be draw my. Yes. That, that was kind of how it started. Right. So like this mm -hmm. kind of, kind of the opposite of normal teching. Um, I will say if you would like the hatchet list uh, with sideboards and the guide and how to beat draw my for your pro quest it is available in our premium discord, um, which is been very, it's been, that list has been very popular with all the sideboards. And matchup notes, especially mm -hmm. going into the ProQuest season. Definitely um, practice that drama matchup, though. It's pretty dynamic. Like, if they don't try to pitch that, you, you need to play it differently. And you should win pretty handily. Yep. I mean, another good example of, like, tacking, I guess, tacking quotation marks, is, like, how we did Kano. We're just, like, if we don't play three Null Rune and two Oasises, we win against Kano 0%. If we put these in, then we win, like, 50%. Mm -hmm. yeah even that stuff's just like so weird like against certain kanos we lose zero percent still but against like factoring the likelihood of paying these five people versus the field yeah versus who's gonna pitch that and not it's hard to put a number to it agree a lot but james i think your your example is the best it's just like how much percentage do i actually get by trying to beat this deck like yeah, I, yeah. Don't go from ten percent to twenty percent. Just because just let it go. You can yeah. make you can make make an old him deck that can beat Prism, some percentage at the time. But that old him deck's gonna suck. <laughs> oh, man. I, I remember you wanted you doing that, being like, "What about eighteen? Go again. Stop. <laughs> Come back." Um, that's why I like the now defunct. Um, if you guys remember the team, like tournaments, uh, where you would play like once a week. I know like, oh, yeah. like way back in the day and uh, you could like you'd register your hero and then the very first season you would see what the other uh, person on the other team you're playing gets registered their hero and then you could just get the whack like the tricked out most versions of decks you've ever seen in your life. You'd be like oh I'm playing a Viscerite um, and I'm playing as something so I'm going to build my whole deck completely differently just to play that one matchup than you would ever see in you know traditionally. Um, yep. Those things were fun. I played Exude Confidence by against the Champleton. It was quite effective. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question here from Clads is uh, any thoughts on Guardian Identity? 
Uh, warriors have a better value slash fatigue game plan. I think that's arguable. Uh, brutes have a better aggressive game plan. They both have better equipment. Uh, guardians are mediocre at both game plans. Question mark. So what do we yeah, think? Yeah, I think the- untalented we- guardians thing is just like being unplayable, right? That's I mean, that's what we say. Right? <laughs> um, I think guardian is the best at card like one card being worth as many as multiple cards for other heroes like guardian has like a card worth 10 the only other class that really has that is like occasionally like rune blade or something and it's pretty hard to fatigue them i guess but then past that i i agree i understand what they're saying without like a talent behind it like guardian just kind of like sitting in this middle ground of like Mm -hmm. i don't know good question because they used to be the fridge class right is what we're saying yeah but it's not that anymore everyone has a fridge everybody now yeah they're like generic fridge they they used like they still have good armor it's just they don't have the extra plus three points that everyone else's armor has that blocks Mm -hmm. similar Mm -hmm. and their boots are actively bad (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah i think that's the issue I, I think they are like the the big number deck but like they need to be pretty careful about printing those like i know they we've heard that they regret like macho grande that kind of thing now to be fair victor is very good yep when it has block cards left in its deck yeah clashing kind of uh op yeah especially if you win them mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. if you win them especially if you win or them. or if your opponent doesn't win them they're usually also fun yes um it's just like i I think victor is is like a good deck it's just that once you run out of block cards that say draw on them your deck is bad like your Mm -hmm. whole deck is just like mediocre yeah i hate to say but i feel like they could use more disruptive attack i don't know what they could use to be fair i definitely do not want more di- <laughs> disruptive attacks than the Guardian players. <laughs> no, I really don't we, either. But we just got concussed. What else do you need? Mm. True. That's like the new Starvo tech. It's great. No, Guardian's fine. It's just like it's the same spot it's always been, and but now they have a high rolly version called Victor. Yeah, I mean they have really good blues, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe the best mm. blues. Not sure. Yeah, yeah, that that's his identity. The best blues. The best blues. Yeah, like they're pretty nuts. Like Rouse and. Uh, Rouse is an everybody card. (laughs) No, no. What's the Everfest one that makes you discard too? I forget. Hammer Thunder. Yeah, like yeah, that that card's so sick. Yeah, they have a good hammer. Their hammer is great. They have so many hammers. They have so so many many hammers. (laughs) They have like four hammers. Yeah, and and they have good shields. I mean, the shields are bananas if you can play them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Hmm. Uh, but they're like they're a fatigue deck in a meta where you can't fatigue because I think they're very good. At fatigue. I think their fatigue is significantly better than Warriors fatigue. Um, Warriors fatigue is whatever. It's not real. Um, it can be, but it, most of the time it's not. Uh, however, the I think Guardians fatigue is like phenomenal. They still have they're still great at it. It's just like the meta just doesn't care. <laughs> it just doesn't care about your fatigue. Yeah. If there's a Kano, like, you just lose the tournament. Like, you just can't win. So it's just, like, there's too many things that are just, like, you can't win. Yeah, and kind of, like, combining all of our points together. Because they have the best blues, a lot of Guardian blues are worth the same as other classes' reds. So when you get to second cycle, you still have better cards than your opponent. And then you just have the best weapons in the game, generally. So those those points together equal uh, Captain Planet. Yep. Y'all can go away. Gar- Guardians have been ha- having having their lunch for too long and having a great time. They can they can be mediocre for a little while. I I agree. <laughs> but enough of these. I mean, Victor's really good in some matchups. He's just backbreaking, like if, yeah, Azaleas and Ninjas, and, um, like those decks. He's just like super positive into. Um, okay. Next, a question here from Millen, and it says he will be going to his first bigger event in Amsterdam. Any advice or a few things that he should do now or learn? 
That's a question. That- uh, I would say like use your pro quests to like practice your prep and like your routine for the day. Mm-hmm. Like have a plan for like, are you eating during the day? Are you keeping snacks? Are you like make sure you're resting between rounds and not just like complaining about um, some bad luck the whole day. I agree. You should use your local events that have some stakes behind them um, mm-hmm. as like a trial run for how you'll act at a tournament setting, um, especially when it comes to food and um, table presence and things you'll do. If, if you're like, oh, I'm going to shuffle people's deck if I, you know, when they hand it to me at Amsterdam, well, then you should shuffle people's deck at like your pro quest. Like you should just mm-hmm. do all the same things so that it's not like an extra thing for you to think about at like a major event. So like all this stuff feels natural when you get there. And then like, do you eat after four rounds? Do you never eat during the day? Do you have snacks in between? Like all this stuff. Yeah, check in how do. you're feeling throughout the day. Yep. Especially at the end of the day. Like if, if you're like unable to function at the end of the day, you got to figure out like, what can you do to adjust and then try it at the next request. Yep. Um, all of that stuff you can practice from now, you know, now till then so that all of that's all taken care of. And then you can just focus on playing and whatever your, you know, your strat is and go from there. Mm-hmm. And at the project, I make would. sure you like make note of like all the things you learn. Like your first major, you're gonna learn some stuff. You're gonna make some mistakes. Just try and make sure you like can use those to make you better next time. I uh, I would also recommend three things, and they're all just card game things. Uh, if you sit across from a good opponent, just treat them like anyone else. Don't get sa- no psyched out by that. Yeah, like don't disrespect all your opponents. Who cares? Treat them even they're worse, just- to be honest. Yeah, they're just people. Internally, not uh, externally. Be nice. Be kind to your Yes, that, that's true. Uh, just remember to have fun, because if you're not having fun, like, what's the point? And the last one, real important, uh, don't uh, equate your self-worth to winning. That's, like, really toxic and bad for yourself. If you lose, you lose. Just move on. Mm-hmm. So just go to the next round. Yeah, great points. Having, like, a learning mentality <clears throat> is really good. So your losses feel like a benefit, not a benefit, but like you don't start feeling bad about yourself. You start thinking about like, what can you do for the next round? Yeah. Yep. All good points. Uh, next is from Sam. It says, currently, I feel like I am a good player, but I want to get uh, towards the next level. Uh, what do you think separates a good player from a great player? Time. Uh, correct attention when you're like practicing and preparing time a lot of time lots of time surround yourself with like good players who like i guess are like proven so that you can kind of like validate that what you're doing is correct time learning from your mistakes like we just said in the previous Mm -hmm. question like if you lose actually sit down and don't just be like here are my bad beats but actually like why did i lose can i correct this if a game came down to one point, it probably meant you messed up somewhere. You, like, we have infinite decision trees in this game. Like, choose a different one. Yeah. I don't know. I feel feel weird about this question because it's like, there's like a part of me that doesn't think we have that many or any real great players right now. We have players who are at the top of the game currently, right? Um, we have people who are great players on individual weekends. Um, but to be like, a sustained great player. I don't know many top players that would even say themselves were great. It's just like a weird mentality to have when you're constantly trying to get better and improve to just be like, okay, I'm a great player. Like, like it almost feels like you're saying you're done. Um, or you're like, there's not m- l- much left for you to learn. Uh, and it's like a dangerous mentality. Like I feel half the time uncomfortable saying I'm a good player. Like I don't like feeling or thinking that I, I'm more like thinking, um, that like I've had good showings. I've had good weekends. Those are different than just being like a good player. And then it's more about like trying to constantly always hit the highs that I have, have have experienced at times. And so like if I've had highs, even still making mistakes and it's like, Oh, I tighten those things up, but it's, it's always striving to, to reach the levels that I felt like I've played at once before. So uh, mentality wise, like if I think I've played a game perfectly before uh, I want to strive to hit that level or higher you know, in the future. Um, now actual tangible things you can do besides just, you know, mentality stuff. Um, but I would, I would be hesitant about how you categorize yourself. Not saying that 
you're not a good player or something weird like that. Just saying like, mm, don't think you've hit a certain level uh, if it if mentally it plateaus some of your learning. Because uh, I've definitely done that myself. I've been like, oh, I'm good, you know, and then I make simple mistakes or I stop focusing on learning, you know, something new and those could be detrimental. But uh, as far as tangible things you can do, record your games and watch them back, then ask someone else to watch them and then ask someone else to watch them. Like that, that'll give you infinite points right there. First, watch it back yourself. See if you identify any mistakes. And then I'd go to someone else you trust and ask them to watch your game. Uh, and you might have to offer to watch one of their games, like as like a trade. So like, you know, you're not just like taking a bunch of someone's time and not giving much back. Um, and I think that's fair. And, but then, and then if you can have someone else watch your games as well, and then like just try and get all their notes of what they think you could have done better. Because in some, even if you all are like around the same level, if you take all of those thoughts and what you could have done differently in, in different situations and combine them together, there's probably a right answer in there somewhere. Right. Um, and that, that'll, I mean, we, st I still need to do stuff like that. Like right no, now. Doing actual work like that is so important. Like yeah. I'd say like 90 plus percent of like even pro tour players is like dropping equity because they don't take the time to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Agree. Okay. Last question here from Fusco uh, with PQ season coming soon and nationals on the horizon uh, and the U S only having two weeks to prepare after the set release. Uh, how do you recommend maximizing time spent uh, to prepare with sh such a short time? I understand what you're saying with the two weeks thing. It's, it is technically two weeks after the set is available in stores, but they did say we're going to have the full set list two weeks before that. Um, so to be fair, it's like a month. Um, so a little better than just two weeks, but yeah, you won't physically, you only physically have the cards in your hand for basically two weeks. Yeah. I'd say have a plan. Like you do need to be pretty efficient with your time. Uh, but probably the biggest thing you can do is join the runaways discord. Um, oh, and get your draft that. practice in. <laughs> yeah. Definitely join the discord for draft practice. Um, I don't know. I can't, I feel like I can't say too much here because like, yeah, this is like a competitive advantage. I think, you know, that we might have as a team is like how to actually prep for this within a one month time frame and get like good results out of it. I mean, we'll see if that happens or not. Um, but it does feel like, you know, something that um, if you have people that you can you can join up with to prep with, this is like one of those times you probably want a group of people um, and not mm -hmm. just like two of you um, It yep. is probably not saying two people can't like, kill it. You could absolutely can. You just, your scope is smaller. I think, Dan, you talked about this on um, Flake's podcast mm, before. Yeah. Was that like the, the real difference between big teams and small teams? And a team can be two people or one person or whatever. Uh, the big difference is the more people on the team, the bigger the scope of the meta that you can try and do attack. Because you can have people work on this hero and this subsect and this hero and this hero and this hero and this hero and this hero. And this hero. Uh, but when you're smaller, you can't do that. You can't, you can't look at every. You basically need to like laser in on the one thing you want to work on and just try and work on that until it's the greatest thing that you've ever done. Um, and like, I think a lot of smaller teams try and still bounce around to try and figure everything out when their time would be better used to just be like, okay, we played three games of Enigma. We think Enigma might be good. We're just spending a month on Enigma, right? Like instead of actually like, May, well, maybe we play Zen. Let's try that out. Maybe we play this. Oh, maybe we play, you know, Riptide might be good now because Dromai's gone. Let's play some Riptide. Like instead of bouncing around, they just like, you just pick one thing and just commit to it and just spend two, like spend four weeks on it. It's like, that's what you have to do as a small team. Um, the advantage of having more people and more bodies is you can then start spreading those people's attentions out into multiple areas so you can have a bigger scope of the whole metagame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you kind of just like have to play online. Like if you don't play online, you're like two plus weeks behind everyone else, sadly, for this set. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you definitely can't just like get all your draft practice probably from armories and then call it a day. I, I looked at the set three times. Would not recommend. I don't know. I know plenty of people who have gone to nationals uh, or other major events and drafted one time or zero times, six owed, like nothing. Make top eight. I think second place of nationals last year, I'm being facetious. I know this as fact. Second place of our nationals last year uh, told me several times that he had not drafted the set at all going before nationals. Uh, and it was just like, 
I'm going to draft chain again. Draft chain twice in like 6 out and just like sweep through, uh, which is great. So that can definitely still happen. What are the odds of that happening? Pretty slim, but they can happen, I guess. I wouldn't, I would try and not do that. I mean, Mo- Monarch was a bit different because it was a known quantity and we already had the set out. So all of the things of like, these heroes are good and this is how they play was like, we already knew this from years before. Yeah. So it wasn't like we had to figure out all new cards. It was all cards that we were familiar with. So like, not quite the same. The real advantage is having Charles Dunn on your team and having him <laughs> break the meta just in a cave by himself being the tin man <laughs> that that's that's the real uh trick but yeah i would recommend trying to get as many people that you have access to together um and be like hey you want to all practice together for this we only have a month right um or maybe have a little bit more because you know you're, you're not going to the u.s uh, but i would try grabbing as many people as you can um it doesn't matter skill level you do, you need people at this point yeah, just collaborate with everybody right? just con- you know just grab your locals to like meet up an extra night a week yeah, whatever you can do, as many people as you possibly can, because you just need you just need warm bodies at this point, because you have such a little amount of time for a brand new set. Uh, so that's what that would be my recommendation of what to do if you're like trying to be serious into like going into nationals and you want to perform and you want to put the work in. Like I would just grab anyone you know for this cycle and say, hey, for four weeks, do you just want to be a team and like try and figure this out? And like ton- you'll have a ton of fun. And by the end of it, you'll all have improved massively. If you're like actually commit to that and then you're just like, we're just going to go hard for four weeks and see what happens. And like, I think that that would be worth doing just in an exercise of itself personally. And you could do it. Please be smart with your time. Yeah. Like, please don't try and test every hero that exists. Yeah. 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 Look at a couple people. Like it's, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's better to just pick your hero. You're going to play and then play it into every hero in the game. It's like a much better use of your time. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, all those questions came from our premium discord. If in the future we'd like to be able to ask questions, uh, on the podcast, then please join our premium discord. The link will be below. That's also where you can pick up not only videos that we released this week, which I did release a video. I wasn't going to talk about this a lot, but I did release a video of beating a prism with the hatchet Dory list. That one is just for anyone who's in the bottom tier. That video is great. They dropped library on turn two. Uh, I think my prism player played pretty well. Um, for what they were able to do. They did set off their combo, and I basically played them to a fatigue. This is how a lot of my matches go if they get a good start. Uh, I think it's a very good example of how to beat um, Prism uh, as, a ha- as a Hatchet Dory deck, which I feel is super favored into Prism personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you, it also has all the sideboard guides and everything else available, especially going into ProQuest season. Seeing as last week we had Prism pop off um, and, and get two top cuts which is pretty good so uh might be worth it so other than that i think we're good here i'm going to go play more Bellatro on my break because that's what i've been doing i have gotten to like second to the last level on one of the decks and i'm just you know trying to get through it so goodbye goodbye yeah we're getting rid of the envelope seven here, but, um... envelope could do darkness. here is go ahead and play the envelope uh, all three pitches of envelope and darkness